evening, everybody, and welcome to this edition of History and Highballs Esport Pottery. My name is Stacey and I handle adult education here at the North Carolina Museum of History. And we're so glad that you're joining us for this evening's virtual event. Um, if you enjoyed tonight's program, we invite you to head over to the museum's website at ncmuseumofhistory.org, where you can learn more about our upcoming programs, exhibits, and digital resources. This is also where you can learn more about joining our wonderful North Carolina Museum of History Associates and shopping in our fabulous museum shop. Um, our Associates and Foundation provide crucial funding and support to the museum, which in addition to many other things, helps make programmings like this evening's event possible. We would like to thank all of you who donated funds towards this evening's program. Uh, we continue to do our best to keep our programs free to attend, but there are costs associated with keeping our series going, and we just continue to thank you so much for your generous support of the museum. A few quick housekeeping items for this evening. Um, we ask that you please keep your mics muted throughout the entirety of the program and to please type any questions that you have for our guest speaker into the chat function located at the bottom center of your screen. At the end of the program, I will ask our speaker as many of your questions as time allows. So it's my honor to introduce and welcome this evening's speaker, Alexander Alex Matisse, artist, potter, and founder of East Fork Pottery. Um, Alex Matisse was raised in a small New England town in a family of artists, anthropologists, and inventors. In 2004, he moved to North Carolina where he attended Guilford College before dropping out to begin three years of apprenticeship with potters Matt Jones and later Mark Hewitt. Matisse now leads East Fork Pottery along with business partners Connie Matisse and John Vigland. So Alex, welcome. Thanks for being with us this evening. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Stacy. Um, thanks for inviting me. Excited to be here and share with all of you uh, a little bit about East Fork. Um, it's a little weird talking into a, a box. There's looks like about 44 of you out there. Um, but this is a similar um, presentation that I give to people on their first day of work at East Fork. Uh, I don't give it to everybody individually, but we they all come together. Um, couple times a year and sit down and I take them through the history of East Fork. Um, and I, I'm sure some of you are familiar with us and what we make, what we do. Um, and some of you are not, but it's, I mean, I'm biased, but I think it's an interesting story. It's a story of uh, change and growth and challenges and, um, and, you know, it's interesting and it's interesting, you know, speaking um, in this context because um, so much of what uh, influenced the beginning of my work and John's work was the historical pottery of North Carolina and the long tradition of pottery that exists here uh, and has existed here for a very long time. Um, and I'm probably not going to go too in depth because uh, there's there's lots of people that can talk far more eloquently about the history of North Carolina pottery, but I'll touch on it a little bit here or there. Um, I'm going to share my screen and then we'll kick off and uh, please make use of that chat. Um, put things in there and at the end I'll try to kind of move faster through this 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 thing can drag on a little bit, uh, but I'll try to keep it moving. And hopefully you stay engaged and it's interesting. So here we go. And yeah, throw those questions as they come up into the chat and we'll make sure to have some time at the end. Uh, we're gonna skip over that. And we're gonna start in the beginning. Uh, my beginning, uh, I grew up in a little town in Massachusetts. My parents were both artists and I have a, a interesting background uh, going back to my great grandfather who is Henri Matisse who you see over uh, on the left side of the screen sitting in bed towards the end of his life um, over this isn't exactly in order but that's me and my father in front of the house I grew up in it's an old Baptist church my parents bought it um, they were looking for a, a farm with a barn to set up their studios in uh, and instead, they found this, this church outside of Boston, 
uh, and it was very affordable because the congregation had moved and they're trying to get rid of it. Um, and so they renovated it. And I grew up in this, in this um, old Baptist church, which was, um, it was a little embarrassing getting off um, of the school bus and, and going up to ring the door. But as I, as I grew, uh, I began to appreciate it more. And um, their art was all around us, as was the art of um, a lot of other artists, in, including Matisse, but um, a lot of other artists, which this guy, who is Pierre Matisse, Matisse's son and my grandfather, um, he was an art dealer. And he brought um, a whole bunch of very well-known artists, or now they're well-known, to the United States. I had a gallery in New York. Uh, and it was it was operated until about 1987 when he died, and um, and the the sort of history of of that side of the family is one of a lot of shadow and a lot of um, you know Matisse was a very very um, obviously well known, very passionate, very focused, very driven individual, and there wasn't a whole lot of room for other people. Certainly not a whole lot of room for other people to explore their own kind of artistic creativity. And so Pierre um, sort of found his calling in representing artists and caring for artists and, and bringing them in. And it was very different back then than it is today. Uh, but he would, you know, essentially give an artist a, um, um, a stipend in exchange for a portion of, of their, their output or their work. And so um, he brought over Miro and Duchamp and Chagall and Giacometti, um, and a whole number of other folks um, to his gallery, uh, all of which du buffet, um, all of which are you know now hanging on the walls of all the big museums. And um, that's my father uh, with me on his shoulders. He is a uh, an artist, a sculptor, a inventor, uh, a very, very bright man um, and um, and his work is more on the installation side of things. Um, and my mother also made work. So that surrounded us all the way over uh, on, the, on the right side is my grandmother. And she was an anthropologist. And she went um, after having two children. Uh, and then uh, basically, you know, she was a, a housewife for, you know, the first 40 years of her life. Um, she divorced my grandfather and went to graduate school and then went on to become the Dean of Anthropology at NYU, did her research at, um, in the Trobian Islands, right off the coast of Papua New Guinea, and brought back a lot of artifacts and a lot of really beautiful objects. And so I was surrounded by uh, art, you know, fine art, um, and then these these more everyday objects that had uh, oftentimes a lot of utility, uh, including some ceramics. And that mix, um, I think really uh, sort of cemented my love of clay, of, of which it has only been clay. There was never another medium uh, that I was attracted to. Uh, after high school, I took a year off. I went to the mountains of New Hampshire, I worked a little bit. I always have liked working with my hands. And then it was time to go to college. And I came and I wound up at Guilford College in Greensboro, which was very serendipitous. I was there for a year and a half. Uh, while I was there, I discovered that I had landed in this state that had this long, rich, uh, essentially uninterrupted history of pottery making. Um, I met potters in Seagrove and I met specifically a potter outside of Asheville named Matt Jones. Uh, Matt's brother went to Guilford, knew the ceramics teacher there. And I um, began to go out and help him fire his kiln. Um, this is a photo of Matt and me uh, the, on the right side with this great big pot between us. We're loading the kiln. I'm probably 21 or 22, no, maybe a little older in that picture. Um, I would go out, I would help fire his kiln, and I was still in college at the time, but I'd go out on weekends, and I remember the, um, the smell of his workshop when I first walked into it. It was very dark, 
It just had two little windows and it had a dirt floor. And this was all by design because it keeps the pots drying very slowly. It keeps them drying evenly. Um, it smelled of wood smoke. It was heated by a wood stove. Um, and it was, it was very nostalgic. It was, it was a very powerful feeling. And I immediately fell in love with that. I dropped out of college um, a year and a half in and started an apprenticeship with Matt. Uh, I built a little cabin that he had started and I sort of finished it behind the old farmhouse. And I would chop wood, I would clean the kiln shelves, uh, help him make clay uh, and do all these chores during the morning. And then in the afternoon I would throw. And the type of apprenticeship that Matt was trained in and then that, uh, that I did with Mark was very, very formal. I equate it to uh, learning classical music. Uh, you're really learning the fundamentals and there's a tremendous amount of repetition, like learning scales. Um, and you're trying to get your hands um, to, to understand the clay. And it's a lot of muscle memory. And um, what Matt would do is he would throw a piece and he would stick it on the end of the wheel and that would be my vision of perfection for the rest of the day. Uh, so it was this very, very formal style of apprenticeship that went back many generations. So uh, the guy down here is Mark Hewitt. I'm, I, I'm sure many of you know who Mark is. Uh, Mark has a beautiful property and workshop and kiln in Pittsburgh, North Carolina, where he's lived with his wife, Carol, um, for, I don't know, 30 years, maybe, maybe more. Um, a really, really amazing, magical spot. And I went to Mark for what he called finishing school. Mark is English. He comes from a line of managers uh, at the Spode China factory in Stoke-on-Trent, which is the, the, the epicenter of pottery manufacturing in England, or it was. Uh, there's still a few firms left, but not many. So Mark, um, Mark I came down. Matt had, had worked with Mark for a short period of time. Uh, there's lots of potters. There's a whole kind of uh, slew of potters in the state that have spent time with Mark, some for three, four years, some for just a year. Uh, Joseph Sand has a pottery in Randleman, uh, just, just south of Greensboro. Uh, and we apprenticed together at the same time. Um, and that was an incredibly formative period. It was three years of my life. Um, I learned how to decorate pots with Matt and at Mark's, I really tightened up my throwing and it was really sweet to see, uh, what happens in these formal apprenticeships, uh, over time, because you're working so closely with somebody, you know, at first the information is just flowing from the, the teacher to the student or the pupil. I don't like to say sort of master, it sounds weird, but, um, and then what happens is the, the influences, they start to sort of go back and forth and you start to bounce ideas off of each, off of each other. And, um, and it's really sweet. So these were some, some plates that I had made at Matt's uh, when I had sort of really started settling into, into the decorating technique that I, that I developed uh, working alongside Matt. Um, I spent a little too much time on that, but uh, I finished the apprenticeship and I moved to Asheville uh, which is where Matt was located. And I had some friends there and that's really the only reason. Um, and I had some, a little, a little money, uh, a little family money that I used to buy this old farm. Uh, it was an old tobacco farm. It had been sort of fallow for many, many years in this dark little holler. Uh, the sun shines in like this for just a kind of, you know, few glorious seconds every day. And then it's back behind the trees. Um, but I moved out there and I immediately met uh, this young woman named Connie, uh, who today is East Fork CEO. And, um, but back then, Connie was working on a goat farm. Uh, in, we met in the basement of this little antique store. She's from LA. I'm from Massachusetts. I don't know what we were doing uh, to both meet uh, where we did. But uh, she moved in a few weeks later and uh, watched East Fork start to unfold. She had no idea about any of what I was doing or the training or anything. She would see these sketches of kilns on, on pieces of paper, what I was gonna build and, and thought I was a lunatic and I think loved that. Um, and uh, eventually 
I actually did start to build things um, after I kind of settled into that farmhouse. Um, and this is the foundation of the kiln. Uh, Connie's laying bricks here uh, for that foundation. It's a very large kiln uh, designed to fire just a few times a year. I was laying the, the arch form. This is like uh, kind of the hull of a ship upside down and the bricks would be laid up on this, which you'll see in a minute. Uh, here's the inside of the kiln looking sort of standing in the very front where you walk into it and all of the pottery would, is stacked in here and you'll see images of how that how that works but this is just a beautiful image again when the sun is shining through right after my little brother swept this out um, and uh, here's the the site in Madison County kind of in its final state we started uh, with this little shop building here it was actually a prefab shed from Lowe's uh, moved it up and then a friend of mine built this beautiful timber frame shed. All of the wood that we used in this was, um, was felled on the property. And we gradually added buildings and buildings. Uh, everything was heated by wood. It was the same. It had dirt floors um, in, in most of it. And it was a really beautiful place to, to make pots. Uh, here I am at the wheel. And here are some finished pots on the, on the wear racks. Uh, everything was built in a very rustic way. It was very intentional. It um, it it was it was what I knew. It was what I'd been trained in. Um, about three years in, maybe a friend of mine who I knew because he was an apprentice for Daniel Johnston, who is another North Carolina potter who worked with Mark Hewitt. Um, John was apprenticing with him, and he had been there for three years. We had met, and uh, and we were friendly. And John came out one time to visit and we started chatting about um, what it would be like for him to come out and, and for us to work together and not in the context of an apprentice uh, and a, a teacher, but as more as equals. And so we, we were sort of scratching our head and it's an odd thing for, um, for potters. You see a lot of married people who um, maybe have a studio together, but it was funny for two people to be making their own work under one studio name, but we thought we'd give it a try. And um, John has brought so much to the business. Um, he is one of the best potters I've ever met. Uh, he's an amazing decorator. He's an amazing artist. He's an amazing poet. He's also really good with the numbers. And as Eastford changed and morphed and grew over, the, over time, uh, John, who's both his parents are accountants, which I don't know, maybe that, that's why, but um, John took over the duties um, and eventually is, is East Fork's uh, chief financial officer. So um, a lot of East Fork's success, I mean, it's really due to the convergence of these three people with three very different skill sets all coming together and bringing something else to the table, which, which I'll get into. But here's John, he's six foot seven, very tall, very skinny, uh, bent over his wheel, making pots. We threw standing up, which is also a, a, a sort of more traditional way to do things. Uh, the clay is splattered everywhere. Um, and you can see the dirt floor under there. Um, a few slides here on, on what we made and how we made it. We made a variety of things, everything from these great big decorative jars here that you see John decorating to runs of small mugs. Uh, where we would weigh up the balls and, you know, that'd be, you know, a, a morning or an afternoon worth of, of mugs that um, you, I would then just sort of work my way through. Um, we are loading the kiln now. Um, the, in this photo, this is Cade, uh, who ended up being our very first apprentice, um, our very first employee. Today we have about 125 employees. Cade was our first. Cade is still with us. And Cade um, now is actually leading up an archive project for us, archiving all of the things that we've made um, over the years. Uh, Cade, you also see here, adding wads to the bottom of these pots as they get loaded into the kiln. And a really amazing thing is uh, the guy in the black t-shirt, Mike Ball, uh, he would help us fire. He's a potter, makes face jugs, things like that. Um, and he would come out and fire his pots in the kiln. And then many years went by and then um, he was working at UPS and uh, somebody had shipped us a box and he had picked it up and seen our name on it and said, hey, from River Birch Pottery. Um, a couple of years later, Mike is working in the fulfillment center 
And um, now Mike is actually making pots and has taken over the position of being sort of East Forks, uh, now sole potter, although we're gonna build that side of the, the program. Um, so really beautiful kind of full circle story uh, in these in these two photographs, which I actually just noticed right now, because I've been working with Mike and and back in the in the clay myself a little bit. Um, so here's the kiln right before it's it's loaded. Again, I don't know. You know, some of you may know this this process very well. Some of you may not. But uh, all of these pieces are put on small bits of clay that keeps them off the shelf because we all. Have, this the entire kiln is heated by wood so you have wood ash that's flowing through and you have salt that is get, then getting blown in at the end that salt vaporizes and then creates its own glaze on these pieces um here is connie uh and our first daughter vita who is now uh, just getting back from her first week at sleepway camp it looks like she's having a terrific time um and Cade is firing uh pots uh, or firing sliding wood into the the front of that kiln and there's some pot sitting there you can see the ash and the salt has created a glaze and it's dripping down the sides of those pieces um I have a little uh video of the firing which I'll play now I may have to exit oopsies let's go back out of here um Hopefully this is working. Is this working? We can definitely see it, but there's no sound. There is no sound. Mm, okay. Uh, well, that's too bad there's no sound. I guess I'll just give you the narration. Because uh, it's just nice music, and you hear the the wood crackling, um, and we probably won't go through the entire thing. But uh, this is a, a video that my brother made of the first firing, or one of the one of the early firings, um, with a little snow, which is always beautiful in North Carolina because it's so rare. Um, that fire is coming out of the chimney um, very late in the firing. Um, when, when it's really hot, about 2,350 degrees. Um, my brother kind of went overboard on the slow motion of this, I'm sorry, but uh, uh, you have to fire the kiln throughout the entire, it's, it's 24 hours. Um, so somebody is always with the kiln. We would do it in shifts, um, about four to six hours per shift. Um, I always really liked the night shift, which started essentially at midnight and went till six in the morning. It's this beautiful, quiet, focused time. Uh, you you really have to stay with the kiln. Um, it's it's kind of almost a meditative practice. Uh, you can't feed it too much wood. You have to feed it just enough. You can't choke it down. If you don't feed it enough, the coal bed burns down, and you lose all the sort of momentum and the energy that you've built up. So it's this, it's a really it's an amazing process, and there's. Uh, a huge amount of work that goes into firing both before, obviously during and after. I mean, before you have to cut, you know, it could be four, five, six cords of wood uh, and stack all of that wood and let it dry. You have to clean the kiln and get all this hardened stuff off of the kiln shelves. And then the stacking, the loading of the kiln, putting the pieces in there takes, oh, three to four days. Um, oftentimes it's in the winter, it's cold, everything's freezing. Um, and in the summer it's hot, you get heat exhaustion, but, uh, I, I love the physicality of it. I love the physicality of everything that surrounded making pots in this way. Um, and there's the old dog who I, I got her in college. So that's, that's the majority of that video. This is cooling the kiln. You can see inside of it, uh, we're getting the kiln to cool really fast um, down to about 1300 degrees so that that glaze stays really clear and uh, it doesn't grow crystals in it through the cooling process. I'm going to stop that sharing. Exit out of here. Go back up. All right, are we back? 
Yeah, we can see it. You got it. Great. So here we are recovering after the firing. Uh, we all essentially have a mild form of heat stroke uh, and are very dehydrated here. Uh, there's Cade and John and Kyle, who is still with us. Um, Kyle used to develop all of our glazes, uh, and then taught themselves how to code. Now is working kind of in our technology department. So people really have moved around a lot, which is really fun. Some more pots uh, from those early days. Um, there's, you see a sort of lot of classical elements, a lot of traditional elements, and then you see some movement to some cleaner, more modern, more simple shapes, uh, which is part of the, the evolution of East Fork. Here are some, some pots of John's. Um, at some point, we want to start a kind of an, a reacquisition program where we can find some of these pieces that, that were so nice, which we, we didn't really save very many of these at all. Um, these are some of mine. I started to experiment with some very, very uh, simple, smooth forms, but with sort of more increasingly complex geometric decoration. Uh, and then here you see what happens with the ash and the salt when it hits the pieces. So just these really rich, beautiful, dynamic surfaces. Um, and pretty soon we're going to start taking a, a, a sharp uh, a veer away from this. Um, and it sometimes is a little uh, jarring, I think, for folks to see that shift because it was very fast, uh, but it wasn't quite as fast as people would have thought. So these are some pieces that I made um, while we were still firing the wood kiln, trying to think about how could we make pieces that, that spoke to say a different audience or could be made in a different way that didn't require the work that could be say wholesale, that just um, different ways to make things. And this was a very, very early exploration into that. Uh, and then it was years after that, that we started sort of doing what East Fork is known for in earnest. Um, these were some lights that someone, a collector commissioned. Um, and this is one of those pivotal moments. I was commissioned by a collector who said, could you make a chandelier? And I made pots. I didn't, you know, this was, it was a totally kind of bizarre thing to request. Uh, but I said, sure. I didn't know what I was doing. So I didn't ask for any money up front. I didn't have an agreement. I didn't do anything. I put a huge amount of time and money and energy into figuring out how to make translucent porcelain and then figured out how to slip trail on the interior of these things to get that to shine through. And then at the end of the day, the, the guy was like, I, I don't like it. I'm not gonna, don't wanna buy it. Um, I never sold him any more pots of any type after that. But uh, that that I do sort of credit that challenge to be one of those moments that got us thinking about other ways to make things. Another one of those moments was a friend of ours in Asheville um, just happened to know the creative director of Calvin Klein Home in New York and introduced us. And this woman, uh, Amy Mellon, who later ended up investing a little bit of money in East Fork, um, liked what we were doing and she would she would work with smaller artisans and and craftspeople uh to do projects but um they they commissioned a set a whole bunch of these jars i can't remember how many of each one i made and i had to sandblast their their logo in the middle of it we had to fire the kiln kind of half full in the middle of winter and then i had to drive the pieces up there in the middle of the night commercially the project was a massive failure but what it did was give us this sort of kick in the butt to, uh, to see, okay, if we want to do something differently, because we did see the need to do something differently. The, the North Carolina collector base was not growing. And we would hear the same thing from people over and over at all of the shows, which is, oh, I, you know, I, oh, this is beautiful, but I don't have, I don't have any more room in my house. And I don't know if any of you have been to uh, a, a hardcore North Carolina pottery collector, but it, it's true. Like the ones that, that are really serious, they don't have any more room. You know, I know people um, outside of Raleigh, Raleigh, good friends of ours who had to build like a whole separate shed just to, you know, it's, it's, it's that sort of thing. So we saw a need if we wanted to kind of grow and, and, and move and, 
do something new, we had to speak to a different audience. We had to look outside of the state, so to speak. Um, and so we decided to buy this little kiln from the Netherlands. Um, oh, well, no, sorry. I, I'll get there in just a second. Uh, we, we, maybe before we pulled the trigger on that kiln, we entered this period of kind of, of growth and of discovery. And this is one of the things that I have brought to East Fork. Uh, I have an intense curiosity and uh, a sort of insatiable curiosity. And I love learning new things. Um, and so for a number of years, I wanted to understand how people made pottery uh, at scale with industrial processes. And so I went all over the US. I went to Mexico uh, and toured a factory in Mexico. Um, and a lot of the factories that I was touring were either like about to shut down or they had just shut down. This factory over here it was in Ohio, Heartstone Pottery. Uh, and I walked in and it, it had been sitting like this for 10 years. And it was like the rapture had happened. People had, you know, the plant manager had come in one afternoon and said, okay, we're shutting it down. And people had put their tools down and they walked out and nobody, nobody touched it again. Uh, and so we were looking for equipment and going around. This is Bennington, uh, Bennington Stoneware in Vermont here, uh, which is still in operation. And then this is Amphora in Mexico. Um, after doing some of this initial exploration, we bought a little kiln from the Netherlands. The kiln that we bought, I equate it to like a going from uh, driving around in a Conestoga wagon to a Tesla. Like it was as opposite a piece of technology as you could imagine that is still doing the same thing. It's still heating pottery up uh, and then cooling it back down in a somewhat controlled fashion. Uh, so this kiln was, was automated and computerized. And another key decision, we could have built a kiln, we could have fired the pots manually, but this let us do other things while the kiln was firing, which was very important. Um, at this point, we were still throwing everything by hand. We had not brought in industrial forming uh, practices at all. Uh, so here's Cade throwing um, a potter's bowl. We still make this form. A lot of the forms from that early period um, are still in production today, although the means of production are, are drastically different. Uh, this is Sierra operating one of the first hand jiggers that we bought. Um, this is a, a piece of equipment that we just decommissioned it, uh, which decommissioning something like this is just unplugging it and moving it out of the factory. It's not a very big deal. Um, but this is, you know, they, they used this process through the Industrial Revolution. So very old way to make pottery, not as old as throwing, obviously, but, um, but this has been around for a very long time. Uh, here we are inspecting a first load of pots. Uh, wide-eyed, wondering what we got ourselves into. Um, uh, this was one of the very first loads that came out of that, that kiln. And you can see here. So a funny story, you know, obviously the work that we used to make was, is far more dynamic. It's far more sort of, uh, it, it has a life that's very different than this work. Uh, this is very beautiful. It's very modern. It's, it's much cleaner. It still has a material quality that stoneware from Target uh, or Williams Sonoma does not have. And that, that is true to this day based on our choices around material and all these things that we think are a great deal about, uh, but very, very different. And so we would sell the pieces by um, sending out a postcard and having a kiln over, very traditional way to sell pottery. And that first time we made a load of these pots, we took a beautiful picture like this, we put it on the cover and we sent it out. And we thought that our collectors, the people that had supported us for the last you know, seven years, uh, maybe it was six years, um, and then had also been buying my pots as an apprentice, would come out and buy them. And because um, normally there'd be a line of 50 people or so when the, you, know, you open your, your doors at nine o'clock in the morning, people have driven out to the, to the studio to see the work and buy it. And we opened the door and there was nobody there. Nobody showed up. And it wasn't until about 1130, um, you know, two and a half hours after the, the opening time uh, that a car kind of, you know, bumped up the driveway and somebody got out sort of just curious to see what the hell we were doing. And, um, and they, yeah, poked around and then went on their way. And now eventually, obviously things changed and we sell, uh, 
quite a bit of pottery these days and we make quite a bit of pottery but it took a while for that transition and and overnight we we lost the vast majority of our of our customers and then started again and built that up um, here you see an evolution of the mug over the years uh slowly changing and um and we started to grow uh we needed some more space we got another little place and downtown Marshall, North Carolina, which is the other side of the county. And we would transport stuff that was totally raw, unfired, very unstable to, to the pottery. Um, just, it was just crazy. Uh, we also opened a little store in downtown Asheville. This was another big shift. Uh, it was not a gallery, which most people would expect. They, you're a potter, you're gonna open a pottery gallery. It was a home goods store. We wanted to present the work around next to other beautiful objects that were usable and functional and centered around the kitchen. Um, and finally, it was time to say goodbye to Raskroom's Road. Uh, we had outgrown it. It was just uh, no longer serving the um, no longer serving the purpose, and we had to sell it for financial reasons, which is very sad today. It's actually an artist residency for centered around ceramics, uh, and a, a woman has bought it and done amazing things with it. So, couldn't imagine a better transition for it, although it was still really sad and challenging. Um, but um, yeah, we needed a place to have a forklift and all of these things. So, um, we found this really beautiful building in downtown Asheville that um, I had actually looked at uh, early on in this sort of process, I had looked at it and I was like, oh, it's way too big. It was huge, it was 14,000 square feet, um, which felt really big for us at the time. Um, and, then, and then I decided to check it out one more time. I went down there with Vita, who you can see has put a few years on uh, at this point and walked around and, and it was a beautiful building and it had really beautiful bones and, that was very important to us uh, at that time. Um, and we decided to go for it. So that's what it looks like today from that same vantage point. It actually is filled with even more stuff now uh, than it is there. Sorry, I'm, there's this beeping, but I'm not gonna even uh, try, to, try to fix it. It's my Google chat thing. People are still working apparently. Um, so yeah, here it is today. Um, this was the second kiln that we bought, a little larger than the first kiln. And um, uh, here is the mold shop where we're making all of the tooling and the dyes and the molds for all of the various processes that we use. Um, this is a, a machine, it's hard to see exactly what it does, but uh, when it runs, it sort of looks like a Dr. Seuss machine. And this is how we make all of our mugs. Um, there was a long period of time when we didn't, we couldn't make a mug. We didn't have the, the equipment to do it. Uh, and being a, a pottery company that doesn't make a mug is, is not a good thing. Um, but we finally figured it out. And this was a, a little machine that actually came from a small manufacturer in China. Most people buy their products from China, but we buy our machines to make our products in the U.S. from China. <laughs> Um, and had a beautiful kind of relationship with the, the manager of this or the sales manager um, during the beginning of COVID. And it was this wonderful kind of bonding moment and we, nobody could get masks. And she sent us a box of masks um, with this beautiful, you know, handwritten note all over it. So we'll get through this together. So making those connections uh, has been really, has been really fun and rewarding. Um, and then we needed more space. And we found a much, much less glamorous factory uh, just down the road um, where we were gonna move fulfillment. Uh, early on, there was like just this little break room in the corner and we were had these little packing stations set up. And uh, now it looks very, very different. It's, uh, this is one of the new kilns that's there. Um, these kilns, there's two of these kilns. Uh, they hold a whole lot of pottery. So right now we have the capacity to make about a million pieces of pottery a year. Um, when it was me in the early days, I'd make maybe 2000 pieces a year or something like that. Um, these kilns can fire every day um, and hold, hold a tremendous amount of work. Um, I think there's, yeah, there is a little video here just of, our, of the, the glazing process. Uh, but just very simple, which 
you can see the glazing and this, this is a sponge belt. And what it's doing is cleaning the clay, the glaze off of the rim of these pieces as they run down the sponge belt. Oopsies, let's go. We decided to open a store in Atlanta. Um, this was a little, this was kind of one we thought we were gonna open. It was gonna be amazing and go, but um, our little store here in Asheville um, does does amazing in this store. It's been it's been a challenge. It's been sobering for us. Uh, we moved the store in the middle of, of the pandemic. If you ever come to Asheville, uh, I hope you come visit us. Um, it's on Lexington Avenue and Walnut. Uh, we're not doing factory tours right now because of COVID, but that is something that um, that one day we will uh, get back to. And then um, just a little context on kind of where we're going. Um, we. We have a vision of building a campus, a big, beautiful campus that has a whole lot of customer facing and educational components, uh, a restaurant, all of these things. If any of you know about Simon Pierce, which is a glass maker in Vermont, um, they have this kind of destination uh, spot. So over the next few years, uh, provided we all make it through the next year, um, intact, which, which I think we will. It's not going to be easy, but I think we will. Um, uh, this, is, this is where we're sort of moving towards, which is getting, you know, we're, we're in actually three different locations now. Uh, I'm in this tiny little satellite office that we had to, to rent because we needed more space. But uh, to get everything back under one roof um, and, and have a place that we can really settle into um, for, for a long time, as opposed to just continuing to grow out of things. Um, and that's, um, that's a abbreviated history of the East Fork. And I only see, uh, one, oh no, there's not even one question. So, uh, I'm going to give you all a bad grade on your question asking until you start populating some questions in here, because, um, I left almost exactly 15 minutes. So uh, I hope some of y'all do. Um, well, Alex, thank you so, first of all, thank you so much for that incredible history. And thank you for, for sharing that with us. Um, staff have some questions, museum staff have some questions for you, if that's okay. And then maybe that mm -hmm. can help generate some, some chat. <laughs> sure. So you mentioned in the beginning of your talk about your, your family and that history, uh, what inspires you? I know that's kind of a, a random question, but whenever we get to have artists join us, it's so interesting to hear the different things that inspire them. So would you share with us what inspires you? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. This isn't a very inspiring thing uh, or way to answer this question, but I've always been kind of had a hungry soul that has been wanting to to do something to make some mark like to to whether it's i don't you know prove something is not exactly it but um to do something of kind of scale and um permanence uh and probably that's has a lot to do with matisse and that legacy and that sort of desire to get out from under a shadow and the course that I took, instead of just like being at peace with it, like most people would be, it would be to uh, try to like cast my own shadow or something. Um, so, uh, I mean, for me now, I, I talk a lot, like people are always asking me, you know, do you miss your craft? Do you miss, you know, the simplicity? Do you miss doing it? And I don't necessarily miss being a potter in that context anymore. Like my life now is, is challenging and dynamic and, um, and, and, and rich and, um, and a little more stressful than it was uh, back then probably, but, um, but it's really exciting. And the, we approach business from the lens of, artists from craftspeople activists chefs like we don't run east fork in a in a way that that most businesses um operate like we um 
I mean, we, we're very engaged in the community. We do a lot of, it's not really philanthropic, but it's sort of a lot of giving work. Um, we leverage our community and our customers to support these various organizations. Uh, we have a very high starting minimum wage um, of $22 an hour, which for, for Asheville is, is pretty high. Uh, it's not actually high enough, but it's pretty good. Um, and, you know, we have a really big people team, which is sort of like HR, and we really work hard to make, uh, m provide resources, provide support for all the employees that work here. Uh, you know, there's somebody you can go talk to about anything and they'll listen and try to sort of help solve the problem. Um, so we approach the business in a very different way. And um, I don't know, I'm, I'm trailing off of your question around sort of what inspires me. Uh, I, I do hope that sort of we, we get to a point where I can get back into some of the creative and, and surface design and decoration. Um, I still am deeply involved in all the design process of every new form that we make. Um, a, you know, a lot of it starts with me and then now our engineer who, who draws things up. Um, so I'm not having to draw things on like this little 2D drafting program, but, uh, yeah. So you mentioned, or you shared with us the evolution of, of pottery, of style. Um, I just have to ask, do you, do you love the, the earlier part kind the most, or are you cool? Do you like the one now that you guys are doing, or is there some third <laughs> option that you want to like kind of veer into or? It will change. I mean, what we're making now, we'll continue to make. That's like a core line. That's if you go on eBay, like the pieces, the early pieces from East Fork sell for more than the early pieces of like Alex and John making pots in the woods, which is really funny. Like there's this collector base that's grown up around that stuff now. We will continue to make that. I would love to build out that hand, you know, the hand thrown studio uh, to have a few more potters. And maybe there's another line there. Uh, at one day, I'd love to build another wood kiln, but that's sort of far off in the future. And right now, we're worrying about, you know, keeping things stable and keeping 125 people employed and making it through a recession and all these things. So I'm not thinking too much about that at the moment, but uh, I love what we're making now. Um, it's, it's, it's beautiful and it's different and it's hard to, it's hard to compare the two. Um, yeah. So last philosophical question, I promise. Um, what do you hope that folks take away from East Fork? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I think, I mean, I don't know what you'll take away from this night. I think when people discover East Fork and they sort of come into the company that we've built and they follow us on Instagram, it becomes very clear very quickly that like there's something else going on here. Like this is this kind of wild idealistic group of, of I mean, most of us are like kids. Um, uh, I mean, there's a lot of young people, there's a lot of people much younger than me that, that work for us, um, trying to do something really different. And then people love the, they love like, they love the, the growth and that, and that evolution and that change and that constant striving. And, um, you know, we're, we're really, we're hard on ourselves. Like we, we try really hard to, to do what we're doing in as best a way as we can do it. Uh, whether that is sort of from an environmental perspective, from a sort of social and ethical perspective, um, uh, from supporting the community. So we, we, you know, that, that's what people take out of these fork. The, the stuff we make, the product is beautiful. Like they are beautiful dishes. The colors are beautiful. People love them. They love collecting all of these colors and watching these things, you know, form in their cabinets. Um, Cause we make new colors every year and we drop them and um, everybody goes wild, but there's something else behind that um, that I think people they see they're attracted to. So it's not just a company that's making something and selling it just to sell it. Um, there is, as John calls it, a, a sort of real earnest striving behind all that we do. Um, that, that's, I think, reflected. And once you, once you get to know 
little, us a little bit better. Thank you so much, Alex, for taking time to join us this evening and sharing East Fork's history with us. And um, as Alex said, if you're in Asheville or in Atlanta, um, stop by and visit. Um, and I will try to drop East Fork's website into the chat so you guys can go check them out as well online. Let me do this really quickly. Here we go. So go check them out. Um, thank you, Alex. This has been awesome and we really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. That was fun. And uh, we hope to see all of you at our next History in Highballs. Bergwin Wright presents Outlander in the Cape Fear. That's happening on Thursday, September 8th at <laughs> 7 p.m. via Zoom. Uh, in the meantime, everybody take care. We'll see you soon. Bye, guys. Thanks so much. Thank you. Good night.